Okay. <laughs> Go. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, welcome this morning to the um, International Humanistic Management Association, um, where we're uh, doing a program on how to teach values. Um, so every month it'll be featuring someone showing how they're um, incorporating values into the classroom. Um, I'm sharing my screen now. Are you able to see it? Yes. Okay, great. Um, and so I'm a Dr. Elizabeth Castillo at Arizona State University, and the co-host is Jennifer Hancock um, in Florida, and we're part of the, um, on the board of the International Humanistic Management Association. Um, so this presentation is being recorded, and we will send it out to you along with the slide deck after the meeting today. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, the key takeaways I'd like to leave you with is, um, that every decision we make, the older I get, I, I'm starting to realize every decision we make is in fact a values decision. That we are valuing one thing over another. Um, the problem is why we make bad decisions is because we don't always think about the values that underlie the decisions that we're making. And so we tend to end up with short-term um, decisions instead of things that are good for our long-term welfare. Um, and so the purpose of this course, um, rather than teaching specific values to students, um, is helping students develop that capacity to step back and reflect and recognize the value implications of the decisions they're making um, to surface the unquestioned assumptions behind information that's presented to them, um, identify and align their values and actions uh, with their aspirations, and then to recognize and assess trade-offs um, as they're making their decisions. And um, the pedagogy uh, for this course is a, an indirect approach. So later I do talk about values directly, but in, initially um, it's more integrating values into relevant practice-oriented learning content. Um, so in the case of this course, um, it focuses on value creation, entrepreneurship, um, and business case studies uh, to show what these ideas look like in practice. Um, let's see. And the course, um, when I came to ASU, I, I, I'm interested in resources, that's my research area. And we had a course called Resource Allocation in Organizations. And it used this Foundations of Finance textbook. Um, and as I started reading the textbook, I realized why our or our, our world is in such bad shape because it had unquestioned assumptions that the purpose of, well, it stated explicitly, the purpose of a firm is to maximize shareholder wealth. That's a tenet that goes through every chapter. Um, and then it focuses only on financial capital. So how to maximize financial returns on investment, um, looking at cash flow, time value of money, um, risk and return, but all through the lens of financial capital. Um, and the problem with that unquestioned assumption lens is that you promote this econom economistic mindset where you're seeing profit as the purpose of an organization and a society even, rather than a means to a higher goal like um, uh, cooperation and well-being and human flourishing. Um, it promotes short-term thinking, so you're always about next quarter's earnings instead of, you know, seven generations out. Um, it, it sees people as a cost center rather than as the purpose of, of um, organizations and uh, human well-being. And it, and it doesn't differentiate how the profit gets made. So if I do it by extracting value, like say through high interest payday loans, that has equal value in this model as if I'm um, actually creating value for society through a social benefit corporation, for example. And so these distinctions are important, but typical finance classes don't talk about these things. And so what ASU let me do is take a cor this course on resource allocation and reimagine it um, so to think more expansively about resources. And as you'll see, this ends up having profound values implications. Um, so we start, you know, with unit one. So just to give you some context, this is a seven and a half week online course for undergraduates. Uh, most of them are sophomore and juniors. Um, and we start at square one. So we don't um, assume they know what a resource is, is we actually start teasing um, that it is, um, so we think it's anything that is considered to be valuable. And this can either be for instrumental reasons because it helps us achieve a goal 
or because we um, just personally value it. And I use the example of Pokemon cards. You know, to some people, those would be worthless. Um, but if that's important to you, it could be very valuable. Um, and that gets us into um, what makes something valuable. And here, it depends on our values, what's important to us, our ideals and guiding principles. Um, situational factors. So I use the example of a pizza, um, that if I just ate, um, a pizza would be rather worthless to me. But if I'm hungry, then I would be willing to pay $20 for a pizza. And so how I value something changes depending on circumstances. And then, of course, the availability of resources. So whether something is abundant um, or scarce. And in general, um, we value resources because they, they help us survive and achieve our goals, um, both as individually organizations and societies. And then we distinguish um, between tangible resources that can be felt and touched, and then the intangible resources, um, like social capital, relationships, knowledge, intellectual capital. Um, and so the course um, takes a more expansive view of resources where we look at both tangible and intangible resources. Um, and then we get into the idea of resource allocation. So once you have resources, how do you decide who gets what? Um, and we define it as the process of managing and distributing assets. And I came across this quote recently that, that budgets are in fact values statements is whatever we invest in is an expression of what we value and what we want to create in the world. Um, but we don't frequently frame it like that. And so um, one of the purposes of the course is to help people see this um, values laden um, framing. And then um, we look at how do you, the, the strategic um, factors behind resource allocation. And typically the finance books talk about things like how do you make your best use of limited resources and what gives us the best return on our investment. Um, I also add, you know, which one is going to help us create more options and more possibilities um, to imagine, you know, a, a new and better future. And then most importantly, what, which decisions support our values? Um, so do we think people are, are worth investing in or do we see them as a cost center and we wanna minimize our investment in people as an example? Um, and then uh, it, helping students, why do we study resources? Um, well, A, of course, they're essential to goal attainment. So you can't build a house, really, if you don't have the resources um, needed to make that happen. Um, and here we get into some like what I, critical social accounting is where I draw this from. But, but resources are, have underlying power dynamics, another thing that we don't talk about. But people who have resources have more agency. They're more able to fulfill their own goals and exert control over their circumstances and achieve what they want out of life. And also, having resources now makes it easier to secure resources in the future. So it's this notion of cumulative advantage. Um, and so these are some underlying power dynamics of, of resources. And then um, the third uh, point is that resources uh, allocation decisions are by their very nature ethical decisions because everyone needs resources to survive and thrive and yet because of scarcity um, allocation decisions tend to benefit some groups or people more than others so how do you ensure equity so these are the kind of critical questions that um, we're trying to help the students develop as they make their decisions um, in the context of, of the workplace. Um, so in unit one, we talk about financial capital um, because I don't think anybody should graduate from college without knowing how to um, read a balance sheet and, and uh, know accounting basics. So their assignment is to do a cash flow statement and a balance sheet. Um, the discussion board prompt though is um, provide your definition of a resource and give two examples and then explain why you chose these. Um, how do they add value in your life? And what the students frequently answer are things like money, cars, um, and, and homes. Uh, but they also um, answer things like time. My students, I love them to death, but they're a little overcommitted time-wise, and so that's a scarce resource to them. Um, so they recognize that. They talk about you know, how their friends and family are supporting them being in school. 
because uh, a lot of them are working adults. Um, the, the library they mentioned as a resource for their, re and, and then their academic advisor who helps them sign up for courses. Um, and so the reflection question for that unit is, which of these resources that you listed did not show up on the balance sheet? And then what are the implications of this omission? And generally, the implications are that we take these unrecognized things for granted and we, we over time, might stop investing in them. Um, unless we really step back and reflect that, you know, that yes, indeed, these are valuable to us and, and we recognize the value they bring to our lives. Um, so that's unit one. Um, and then unit two, we dive into social accounting as a remedy to start making these intangible, invisible resources that are fundamental to our happiness and well-being uh, visible. And um, I like the social accounting model because it uh, and it's particularly integrated reporting, which is a type of social accounting, because it aligns values, vision, and goals with our mission, objectives, and then metrics, uh, which we'll talk about a little bit more. Um, and so by using the social accounting framework, you can integrate all of these layers into your organizational decision-making, operations, and reporting um, to look at your organization more holistically and under, and recognize the relationships between the business and the larger society and community in which you're embedded. Um, the other thing I like about social accounting is it, it specifies who are we creating value for. So in the traditional finance book, um, it was about all about shareholders, right? There was one group of people, the, um, the capital investors, um, and, the, and the purpose of the organization was to, make, was to make that group happy. Well, what that book doesn't talk about is those, those decisions then often come at the expense of the other stakeholders. And so social accounting asks, asks us to scroll out and, and recognize who is in our value creation ecosystem and how are we creating value for them? And so um, usually do a stakeholder an analysis, that's part of um, integrated reporting. Um, and then the third thing uh, that I like about social accounting is it is a way to give voice to values. And so one of the questions um, in the registration uh, thing that you all signed up for was, was how does my museum background um, help me understand um, you know, these ideas. Well, um, working in the nonprofit sector, what I realized is that we count on so many resources um, to create value for the community, but we are um, pigeonholed into thinking about everything through the lens of the balance sheet. And so I went back to get my PhD to, um, you know, shine a light on what are these other resources, and more importantly, how do they work together synergistically um, at multiple levels, so individual, organizational, societal, and global, um, to create this value creation ecosystem over time. Um, and I'm going to be diving into um, some, of the, some of these different types for examples, um, but the, the main point is that there, we have about 21 capital types of resources. Um, and capital I focus on because it's resources that, that endure and create more resources. And so that's where the, it's a multi-capitalism is what, is what we call it. Mm. So for example, um, we, one of the unit three, we talk about human capital. Um, and instead of just looking at it as, you know, humans as this one dimensional being, we, we talk about the different dimensions of humanity um, so our creativity, our intellectual rationality, the psychological aspects of us, um, our moral um, intuition and imagination, and then of course our physical well-being. And the case study example that we use is um, Google's um, Project Aristotle. I don't know how many are familiar with this, but, but Google did this interesting research about what made effective teams. And they thought it was going to be, oh, the smartest people make the best teams. And what their research showed is, no, it really had less to do with intellect and more to do with this notion of psychological safety. Is were the groups safe spaces where you could dissent and talk about things in a way where you were not going to be attacked or marginalized? 
And so at the, at the basis of that is our willing to make ourselves vulnerable, right? And so many organizations are toxic and you do not dare make yourself vulnerable. But what this ends up doing is in, you're not getting your best ideas and creativity um, from your, your people. And so untangling what are the different dimensions of human um, capital and how can um, leaders uh, create structures and processes that activate all these multiple dimensions of our humanity in our organizations. Um, another you know, thing we cover in unit three is natural capital. And I guess this has been one of my surprises is I thought um, the younger generation would have a better grip on um, you know, what does nature do for us? It, you know, it's not just this nice thing out there, but um, it actually provides a lot of services for us that we take for granted. So as, as far as you know, protection from natural disasters, um, pollution uh, mitigation and mediation, such as um, estuaries, um, carbon sequestration, um, and then of course the intangible dimensions like our spiritual health and, and being replenished by being outdoors. Um, and so uh, recognizing this as a, a resource that we are, are dependent upon, it's the planetary boundary that you know, we're pushing the limits on. Um, and then how can we, we can support um, nature instead of draining from it um, is one of the things. And then uh, in each unit, we talk about metrics. So it's what is the resource? How can it be developed? Why is it important? How does it add value? And then how can you measure it? And so here, this was a tweet from a company I love in San Diego. It's called Dr. Bronner's Magic Soaps. They're like a natural um, soap company. Um, and they do what they practice what they call constructive capitalism. But um, here, you know, some of the things they're proud of is they pay their minimum wage $19 and 23 cents. Um, they have a gap cap of on salary differential. So the highest person doesn't make more than five times the lowest paid person. Um, they donate a third of their profits to charitable causes. They provide free health insurance to both the staff and their families and they do certified organic and fair trade. So I frame these metrics in terms of the, the various capitals, um, such as human and natural. Um, Elizabeth, real quick, there is some confusion about whether this is part of a long example. Let me see if I can read the question. Um, uh, is this part of a long example of, I'm not quite sure what they think. Um, I, if you can address what this, so for the people that are asking the question, this is a program on how we teach values in the classroom. And Elizabeth is going through a course that she teaches and what the elements are of and how she integrates values into uh, a financial accounting uh, and resource allocation class. So hope that helps. Okay, is, that, is it good? I hope so. <laughs> okay. Um, and then uh, we talk about social capital, so which is how do we relate to people, right? And so we can either relate based on reciprocity, where we're creating mutual benefit for each other, or we can extract value um, where I'm taking advantage of you, say, so for a um, high interest payday loan is an example. And, and we talk about the systemic effects of that. So that if I am treating you through, based on reciprocity, you're going to want to do business with me again. And so that sustains our relationship and our exchange over time. If I'm extracting value from you, um, then I'm, it, it um, takes away the long-term ability for the parties to engage and the desire to engage. So it really erodes the, the foundation of the economic system. Um, and then one resource that I want to talk about, um, because one of the questions I got was, how do you infuse values, um, you know, spirituality in particular, into um, your coursework? And so I do talk about spiritual capital, you know, this relationship, being in relation to something bigger and greater than ourselves. Um, but I do it in a very expansive way. So you can, you know, for some people that is expressed through religion, but others, ancestors, nature, our values, um, fulfilling human potential, and then uh, organizations like Conscious Capitalism talk about higher purpose. Um, so spirituality manifests in a lot of different um, dimensions. 
um, and, and recognizing that as a resource so we don't you know, discount it or marginalize it is um, one of the important lessons. And the students really seem to resonate with this. Um, and here I want to share an exercise, and this is where we get into talking about, you know, values more um, expressly, but it's a, a website I would encourage you all to check out. It's um, through a company called Bain and Company, and they do this 30 elements of value. And so they did this research on, you know, what is the value that organizations create for society? And they, um, their findings, they coded into themes based on Maslow's hierarchy of value. And so when you go to this website, um, you can look by industry to see, um, you know, what are the values that industries tend to produce. But then you can also toggle onto each value. And as you do, it will then bring up, you know, what is the value? And then what is an example of a business that is enacting this kind of value? So the assignment is for the students to play around and, and identify what values resonate with them and then what businesses are doing it um, and then describe how they're enacting these. Their final project is to pick a, a firm and so they have to analyze which values the firm is producing um, through this lens. So that's where we start getting more specifically into values um, is to show that in, in fact, the purpose of a business is to create value, and, and these are some these are the um, different categories of value that organizations can create for people. Um, and then we also get into power again through political capital, um, showing that it's uh, you know our relationship to legal and, and formal authority, um, and you can develop it either you know through extraction which is like lobbying and regulatory capture um, or you can do bottom-up you know community building and um, grassroots organizing and generate power and political capital that way um, but naming the power dynamics um, is important for organizations um, and then the uh, Last one I'll talk about is the rule of law, which is a, a form of governance. Um, Hernan de Soto talks about it a lot. Um, but how do you um, improve, get decision making and performance? Who has a right to be at the table? Um, so often our organizations are run by elites and then everything else is top down command and control. But in fact, you know, who gets to sit at the table matters. And um, if you're only having certain perspectives guide the decision making, you're missing out on um, a lot of um, knowledge and, and resources and, and, what, and aspirations of what other people want to accomplish. So it becomes more hegemonic. Um, and expanding who gets to sit at the table. So I, I use um, Eleanor Ostrom, uh, who's, she's my hero. She won the Nobel Prize in 2009, um, but she has these design principles for governance that's more inclusive and participatory. Um, and so I use that as a model of alternative governance um, organizations. And uh, one of the skills we develop uh, at this, for the students then is systems thinking. Is it, so instead of looking at things just as superficial, you know, resource allocation um, events is looking at, well, what are the patterns and trends? So I notice that I'm devoting a lot of resources to this. What does that say about me? And then what are the structures? Because I have systems and reporting structure set up, um, that means that I may, you know, get in a habit of allocating resources a certain way and then fail to attend to other things such as investing in people and their professional development, as an example. And then the, the undercurrent, the mental models of, well, what are the assumptions that I'm not surfacing um, and that I need to step back and reflect on so that I can change my patterns of behavior. And the, the takeaway is that, you know, our behaviors, we think of society as this thing out there and that we're sort of a pinball victim to, to these structures. But in fact, you know, the choices and decisions we make, they create these structures and our values and our culture. And then those choices either um, enhance or inhibit our future developmental pro um, possibilities. And so the the opportunity for us, you know, with humanistic management is to start expanding our developmental possibilities by recognizing, you know, the impact of our choices and, and how we can make different choices to create different outcomes. 
Um, and the um, closing thing is that we, we, the multiple capitals, we have the different inputs, you know, natural, human, natural, and the financial capital, and then showing what are the outcomes they produce, and then tying them not just to our own organization, but then connecting them to the global um, uh, and community, as such as the sustainable development goals. And so that's another reason I really like the social accounting framework. Um, and the, the takeaway uh, for the students is that the process of value creation is also a values creation process because our economic exchange is constitutive. Um, it's not just instrumental. Um, it, it shapes and reshapes our culture and the power relations. And this can either improve or thwart um, human development. Um, and so the choices we make are important for that. Um, and the, the closing uh, leadership takeaway for the class, which is the last module, is how do we do humanistic management so that we expand developmental possibilities instead of you know, limiting them. And um, Maslow, he's well known for his hierarchy of values, but his, later, his last work, um, he had this work called Eusyche in Management, now it's called Maslow on Management, and he really saw our organizations as the next place where self-actualization was going to take place. Um, and so how do you, um, instead of just being a place where you earn money for a living, how can it help you be a better and more um, robust human being and then a society? Um, and examples of, of this that we're seeing now are like Frederick Lalu, the Teal Organization. Um, I have the link here for you to check out. And then um, Raj Sisodia ha just has a book out on the healing organization, is how can we you know, bring our multiple dimensions of selves and, and um, structure our workplaces so it can help people uh, self-actualize. Um, and so I'll, I have a list of resources and then um, how to get in contact with me. So uh, feel free to reach out to me. I'm happy to talk about this stuff and, I, and share my syllabus if that's helpful to anybody. So yeah, a lot of people ask for the syllabus and also for the slides. And so, and again, we will be posting um, as much of the resources as we can on the, the IMA website um, and we'll get that out to you along with the video. So. Okay. So, um, so that'll do it. I think I'd like to open it up for questions now, if that's um, good. All right, hold on. So uh, we have, there was a lot of uh, comments as you were going along and we'll start with them. Um, so hold on, let me see. Let's get to the first one. Um, people do want a copy of the PowerPoint and they do want your syllabus. So again, we'll make sure um, we get that. Um, so I guess the, the question is, uh, let me see, syllabus, syllabus. Is there a downside to using capital slash resource framing? Oh, yes. Uh, is that Michael Pearson's, <laughs> Pearson's question? Um, it's interesting because the first Humanistic Management Association meeting I went to in, at New York at Fordham, um, there were some people from Europe there, Spain and, and other places, and boy, they came down on me hard. Um, and it's very interesting because um, they don't like the word capital. Um, and, and I can see why it, it does have this instrumental connotation to it. Um, but one of the slides I didn't share, but I talk about in, in the last module of the course, is I use capital, this broader framing of capitals, as a proxy for capabilities. Um, and for those, like um, Amartya Sen, um, the economic Nobel Prize winner who talked about capabilities development, and Martha Nussbaum. Um, and so, you know, to me, capitals is not in instrumental. It's just this notion of, of a resource that endures and creates more resources, the generative capacity. Um, but, but that is another, it hasn't come up in my class, I think, because I'm mostly teaching to American students. But um, the, it is a, a worthy discussion. Um, and I do in the course make clear that I'm using capitals as a proxy for capabilities. Very interesting. Um, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat room and we'll make sure to ask them. Um, the general consensus is this is really interesting and people want to dive more into each of the individual topics you brought up. Um, how, I guess the question I have is how did you get permission to 
rethink and redesign the resource allocation course? <laughs> That's a great question, Jen. I mean, I, I feel like, um, you know, God puts us where it bloom where we're planted, right? And so we land up and the universe has a sorting hat. And so me coming to ASU was such a blessing because if you have a good idea here, they will let you run with it. Um, the choice I had to make was do I develop a brand new course, um, but or do I try to adapt an existing course? And I went with the adapting existing course, A, because I thought what we were currently teaching was dangerous. I mean, just this notion of financialization um, is really toxic. And so I wanted to you know, uh, create a different perspective. Um, but our charter at ASU is we are also very committed to environmental sustainability and inclusivity. And so the values of the university, which is our guiding principle, as long as what you want to do fits in with the, those charter values, they'll let you do things. Um, so I pitched this to the to um, my supervisor, the, my faculty head, and they and he was very excited about it. And um, I was able to um, turn it around, you know, within one semester. Um, and so I've taught it now. This is the the second year I'm teaching it, and the students just love it. Um, I didn't put a, a talk about that, but the, the general, um, I'm studying what are the, the changes, the shifts in the students' thinking, and the, um, the three broad categories is, is, one is hopefulness. It's like, wow, we have all these resources at our disposal. That's so neat, it's, and it creates more of an abundance mentality than a scarcity mentality. So that, that's one thing. Um, one of the reactions I get is um, a pattern I'm noticing is anger. Um, how did I get to be this age um, and nobody ever told me that relationships, you know, social capital was a resource? And I say, well, it's like, you know, a fish that it, it's in water. You don't realize the water is valuable because we just take it for granted. But in fact, you know, even though we talk about competitive advantage, our economy is based on cooperative advantage, right? And so this framework helps um, people understand the, the, the importance of social capital. Um, we also get into things like, you know, how do the, our individual relationships end up creating either social um, uh, cohesion or, you know, as we're seeing in the United States and other places, social polarization, right? Um, and so uh, these are examples have of how individual um, choices and relationships in a workplace end up having these macro effects um, that can make society better or worse. So if someone wanted to, your, what would your advice be for someone who wants to take kind of what's tr a traditional course and rework it to be values centric? What, what is your advice for them? Um, I think that goes to the, the um, pedagogy uh, key takeaway is I, I have found, and this is also from my parenting, when I try to approach things directly, sometimes people tune out if they're not, you know, ready to receive on that wavelength. And so I try to weave things in indirectly. And, and in, in this case, it's like, well, what will they pay attention to? And I found everybody is interested in resources. Um, it is a driving principle. So if you can find the thing that people will pay attention to in your realm, you know, entrepreneurship is another big one, right? Is that's the buzzword at, at ASU. We're all about innovation. Um, and so those are things people are willing and able to hear and, and um, process. And so in showing how, what are the values um, implications of the, the uh, topics related to those, um, that's how I found has been the, the most effective way. And then also um, case studies. Um, so for example, um, a, a case that the students really love is some research that came out of Harvard. Um, how did independent bookstores reinvent themselves in the face of disruption by Amazon? And it turned out they did it by building community um, with their the people who came in and creating this sense of that you were cared about, um, that you were listened to, and those that that feeling and experience of being in that bookstore and that sense of community, Amazon cannot compete with that. And so um, by and then there was a macro structure of the American Booksellers Association that disseminated best practices as stores were finding what worked and what didn't. Um, and so creating this network effect of best practices rooted in social capital um, was how the organizations were able to survive. And, and so the students love the case studies um, and 
the what you'll see is when you read them though is a lot of times they're not framed in terms of capitals or you know the different um, resources and so that is you know how you help the students step back and reflect well what's really going on in this case great um, so Leslie says my research specialty and practice area she's an accountant is around moral disengagement and fraud and one of our major issues is that the values brought into the organization don't mean that we don't lose sight once we're there. Is there material you include on how to practice the values you're discussing in the class once they're in an organization where they aren't in positions of power and privilege? And how, how would you respond to that? Uh, well, I heard two questions there. I mean, one is um, if you're leading from a place of informal authority, is that you don't have a lot of positional power Right, and there is like leading by example, and I would also say, um, uh, so making sure that your actions match your, your um, espoused values, but also, you know, making values uh, transparent and part of conversations. I mean, it's sort of like the V word is we just don't talk about them, right? But if we can in our meetings start, you know, every decision we make, what are the values? What are the assumptions behind it? I think that is, is one way. Um, and then, you know, since she's coming from an accounting field, uh, and I listed in, in the resources, but the Indiana Society of CPAs has an amazing um, resource. They put out an integrated report every year, and it talks about their stakeholders, the different types of tangible and intangible resources that they use. And I would love to see every organization, you know, go to that model. So I encourage you to, to check it out and use it as a template for um, how you could be, it, framing your own organization's work. And even if you can't um, do it organization-wide, within your department. Um, so an example, one of the challenges of being at ASU is like this a huge battleship, right? And we're, um, uh, and I have tried to get integrated reporting taken up at the university level, and I haven't had a lot of success because I do not have positional power here yet, right? I'm, I'm not tenured yet. and. Um, so what I'm going to do is pitch it at my unit and my uh, my department and my college level and try to get it going in the um, in our department to start framing it in terms of okay well what is um, how does equity and diversity show up in our our metrics right and um, and use that as a measure for social capital and so create a dashboard. Um, based on these multiple capitals so that we can see how are our value, or how are we accounting for our values. Um, so that's, so keep your fingers crossed for me. I'll let you go know how that goes next year. <laughs> Great. I think the most interesting thing for me about your presentation was um, that you made values valuable as a practical tool for people trying to work in business. You know, um, when I took a look at the Bain stuff and the stuff you were sharing a few weeks ago, I was like, wow, you know, this kind of explains a lot about how I've gone about trying to create my business because it's not just been about money in and money out, right? It's been about building the relationships and the, the other things that go on. So I love the idea of helping students understand that values is a valuable skill and a valuable tool for the organization. So um, the next question we have is, have you taught this to a non-US audience? Um, I've had a couple, a few international students. Um, so I guess in that sense, yes, but it hasn't been the primary focus of it. Um, and uh, one of the things I talk about, so in that the unit where I'm talking about Eleanor Ostrom and the rule of law, I do talk about indigenous governance um, as an example, um, because um, a lot of the Western models of um, governance are based on command and control, top-down imposing order, whereas indigenous um, societies, their governance structures are more organic, bottom-up um, autonomy, where, where people um, all can weigh in, such as talking circles. Um, and so how can we bring those indigenous practices to um, our organizations? I mean, that's sort of what like the Teal organization is getting at. And then um, we had Doug Kirkpatrick on it from Morningstar Farms, and he talked about self-managing teams as another example of how um, you can bring self-organization into the workplace. Um, and, and I also, because I worked many years at the San Diego Natural History Museum, I use 
nature inspired principles. Um, and so, you know, how does self organization show up in nature and how can those principles translate to our organizations? Really interesting stuff. So Ken says, I'm so interested in social accounting from the point that you have been presenting. Um, I am interested in social entrepreneur or action research and social change. However, I do not have any idea of the relationship to the discussion that you are doing. So, um, you know, I guess the question is your, your uh, presentation was about, um, you know, financial resource allocation or resource allocation, which used to be limited to financial. Um, but does this relate to social change or social entrepreneurship? Well, it's very interesting. So yes, um, so I work with a, a I'm, I'm, you know, doing some pro bono volunteering with an organization called Seed Spot, which is an entrepreneurship incubator focusing on underrepresented populations. Um, and so um, it, we are working on getting an article published about how can you use this multiple capital model um, as a framework for developing business models for startup companies. So it is very helpful to show what are the resources an investor has or a, a, a startup entrepreneur has at their disposal. A lot of times you don't have cash, right? It's just startup, but the relationships, um, the, what the research shows is who you know and, um, and then the confidence that the, the investors have in you. Um, the, the research shows that the, the um, head, the venture capital funds investing in people, the leader, the confidence they have in the leaders, not so much the idea necessarily. Um, and so showing, you know, um, using this multiple capitals framework to show what are the different resources that are involved in creating a business um, are, is it's, so it's very applicable to, to entrepreneurship. Again, if anybody has any questions, please ask them in the, um, in the chat. Um, Elizabeth, I, you know, when you were talking, I was, every time I go to a presentation by anyone, I, you know, I think all of us are thinking about how it relates to our own experiences going back. And, you know, my leadership experience and training comes out of social activism and uh, nonprofit groups. And so I think right off the bat, I think one of the reasons I'm so attracted to this is because it's kind of how nonprofits and social activism is organized to begin with, because you don't normally have financial capital um, in the nonprofit. And so you have to take advantage of all the other capitals um, and all the other capabilities that you have at your resources to eat, get anything done. So I, I, I think it'd be really interesting to kind of look at how nonprofits manage capabilities as a model for maybe how businesses could think about operating themselves. Um, we have another question from Allison. How do you think the current environment and attention to social justice could help motivate change in organizations towards a more value-centric approach? There are lots of organizations that are using this environment in an opportunistic way, but how can people challenge that and hold them accountable? Yeah, the accountability piece is key. Thank you so much for bringing that up, Allison. Um, because there's this um, thing called greenwashing, right? Is that you want to jump on the top, hot topic bandwagon, um, but you're not really doing any actions to support that. You just want to be branded yourself as as woke or woke washing. That's another um, term that that we hear. And so what the the social accounting framework does is it's, it enables to you to show your stakeholders very transparent transparently, where are the investments you're making? You know, how does your financial investment support the, the development of these other kinds of capitals? Um, and without that kind of transparency, you're right, um, it's easy for companies to pull the wool over people's eyes. Um, just issue a statement and then say that they're, you know, morally um, woke. But um, so looking at the behaviors, and I'd say more important, what is the logic model or the, the theory of change behind it? Um, to, and where, how are their resource investment, their financial resource investments um, matching that? So um, I hope that answers your question, but, but the notion of accountability is really important. And that's why these integrated reports um, are important so that the, the company can demonstrate exactly how are they enacting their values. And I guess, you know, how do, 
you know, I look at some of the, when a company has a corporate social responsibility and you look at their statement um, in support of that, often it looks like someone just, you know, they had to put out a report. And so they just kind of put together some good sounding words, but there's no real substance behind it. Um, how can we as individuals, but also as um, stakeholders in a company that we maybe buy from, um, or people that are working at the company help make that more, the, the, the responsibility part more integrated into how they do their work as opposed to we have to do a report once a year for whatever this is. Yeah, and that's um, one of the things is like CSR is just this, um, you know, surface glossing over, but um, integrated reporting really makes it part of the business model so that it's baked in from the beginning your values. Um, and then the whole thing is how are you enacting those values. And so it shows from the resource inputs to the business model to the resource outputs. And then how do those um, benefit society and then also circulate to become new inputs for the organization. Um, so the, the reason that this works is that it's very functional, um, right? You're creating value at two levels. You're creating value for the organization, but you're also creating value for the larger society. Um, and by shining a light on that process, it's more likely um, that uh, you won't have the value extraction. And so what I think, um, as consumers, we can be doing is asking for this kind of more integrated reporting from our companies um, to show. So like Dr. Bronner's is an example. They put out a, an integrated report, um, the Indiana Society of CPA. And, and I would also say try to, to start doing this in your own organization. Um, I'm really working to get this taken up in the nonprofit sector. And I have to say, I'm, I've been a little disappointed um, how reticent people are. Um, the nonprofit sector tends to follow what business practices are in a lot of ways in terms of management. Um, and, but to your point, Jen, I mean, me working in the nonprofit sector, that's where this whole model came from, you know, how I expanded it include, you know, the moral and the spiritual capital is because these are the resources that an organization has control over and that you can create internally in the organization, right? But because we don't frame it that way, we discount them and then we underinvest in them and, and we end up, um, you know, always start for cash. So rethinking about what, what a resource is, is, is really fundamental to creating long-term sustainability for our organizations and society. So um, on that, and we do have a couple more questions, but I want to follow up on that. Uh, the, one of the things that I'm attracted to by your work is this idea of developing resources as opposed to extracting resources. When you develop resources, it's, it's, it's not necessarily um, sustainable or uh, I don't know what the word is I'm looking for, but it's, it's fundamentally different from resource extraction, which you're depleting your resources as opposed to developing your resources. Can you talk about that? And then we'll go to one of the other questions. Yeah, that's interesting. And thank you. That's a great point. So in, in the nonprofit sector, resource development is a very common term. Um, and there are positions called, you know, director of resource development. I do not find that term in the, the for-profit. Um, in, the, in a lot of the uh, literature in the, the for-profit management is focused on resource control of external resources. And so t takeovers um, and you know, partnerships, and but basically how can you, you know, control resources externally? Whereas I think you know, from an entrepreneurship mindset and the, the social enterprise and nonprofit mindset, it is about developing these resources um, internally um, and the, the beauty of that is that these are renewable resources. So for example, um, relationships, if you're investing and attending and acting ethically in your relationships, that is a resource that is going to endure over time. Um, and, and so it becomes, you know, a, a foundation for your organization that it can count on. And when you get into bad times, you know, your vendors are going to cut you a little slack because you have been so good to them in other times. Um, but uh, the, the management literature doesn't talk about, you know, social capital as a resource that can be developed. And so you tend to get into this more instrumental value extraction mindset. Um, where it sees it wants to, you know, shift risk onto the vendors, for example, in your supply chain. Um, and that is not um, conducive to long-term um, 
exchange. Um, do you have any particular resources you prefer as your model for the reflective process of identity, identifying and challenging assumptions, such as the Brookfield or Argyris? Ar 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 I like how you're getting into it indirectly. I'm just wondering if you have any resources that you have found helpful as a facilitator of those conversations in the classroom. And this is from um, Leslie. Oh, okay. Yeah, there's um, one. Uh, so there's two models that I really like. Um, one is called integrative thinking. And in the resources, I'll share the article on that. But it has an excellent model, a graphic that I really love. And um, it, but it, it, it surfaces values and valuation power dynamics and who gets to sit at the table. Um, I forget what the, the third component is, I think discourse. And, and, and so how do these components come together to surface values, assumptions, and trade-offs um, to, to think more holistically? So that's one model I really like. And then um, the other one is, um, it's called critical heuristics, and it's looking at um, systems perspective, but from a critical perspective to see, you know, what are the different layers involved in systems thinking. Um, and it gets to a lot of these intangibles like power. So we have kind of a, a few uh, related questions that are the next. How do you help students overcome their online shyness? And do you have any advice for a doctoral student who hasn't started teaching yet? but who's about to start teaching for how they should approach uh, teaching values in the classroom? Um, well, for the, the new teacher, I mean, I would say like model the behavior. So as much as I attend to content, I really spend more of my time engaging with the students on a, on a positive way. So I, I, I give them very personalized feedback and I always frame it, you know, in terms of gratitude. Thank you for the great work you did here. Um, here's what you did well, here's some opportunities for improvement, and, and thank you again, and using their name. I teach on an on, in an online environment. Um, I think that is harder to build that kind of rapport, but, but um, I feel like half my job is helping the students show up and be engaged, um, because it's, it, it requires a lot of self-motivation to take online courses. So attending to the personal nature of, of the instruction, to me, that's where I spend most of my energy, not as much on the content already. Um, because a lot of in-person teachers are now going online, I'd like you to expand on that a little. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. um, because I think that would be helpful to everyone because it, there's a good chance a lot of the teaching will be online in the fall. So um, from structure to feedback, how do you get people to overcome their shyness to even talk about values and engage with the content? I think that's something that a lot of teachers are going to have problems with. Well, for the values, um, I'm not asking them to like put themselves out there in any way where they could be criticized. But um, so for example, and I'll share this article too, that, that I close with an article what's called on family capital. And so how are these different types of values and resources showing up in your own family situation? And even with the, the budget and the cash flow, it's like, okay, do this for your personal household. So um, assigning things in ways that are relevant to the student, you know, where they are, both at, at the personal level and the organizational level, and then relating them more to the academic and abstract. Um, so making the ideas co very concrete is, is very important. Um, what, what was the other part of that question, Jen? Um, I don't remember at this point. <laughs> As I was looking at the next question. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, so Cynthia from Global Dignity said that this does go beyond business organizations, school, so, school systems, the nonprofit sector, public agencies, government, all need a new paradigm. Some of the most toxic workplaces are in the nonprofit and public sector. Um, so it's much more fundamental and potentially transformative to not just business, but all organizations. Do you want to comment on that? Yeah, I do. And I, I, she really picked up on something that resonates with my own experience. So I hate to say it. I mean, I love the nonprofit sector, but I will never go to work for a social service agency because some of the ones that I've consulted with, they are very toxic. And what I've noticed is that they have what they call a parallel process. So they're working with domestic violence, for example, but the same dynamics that go on with codependency and domestic violence, they are manifesting in their own workplace through dysfunctional power relations. 
Um, and so that's one of the reasons that I'm really a big fan of that um, Frederick Lelou's Teal organization is helping organizations shift um, to a developmental um, perspective in organizations. Um, and another book I really like is Robert Keegan's The, the Everyone Organization. And I think that, yeah, oh, an, an Everyone Culture. So I don't know if you can see it, um, but th this is, um, you know, some of the ways. And, and the other intervention that I make, um, I, one of the modules we teach on process capital is the importance of organizational learning. And so I'll include a, a link too to the learning organization survey. And it's very fascinating, but it can be a diagnostic for where is your organization stuck? And a lot of times it's on these kind of toxic inter, interpersonal relationships. And then I'm getting, I think it was Ken who had asked about action research. So framing your, your action inquiry as a process, you know, to develop learning capacity in organizations, I found to be a, a very effective um, intervention. Uh, the other class I'm teaching right now is leading organizational change. You know, basically helping organizations get out of their own way so they can remain adaptive and sustainable. Um, and organizational learning is fundamental to that process. Great. So um, we're just about out of time. Do you have any final thoughts you want to leave people with um, before we end the call? Um, well, I just you know, encourage you to, to start thinking more expansively about resources and more importantly to start you know, having these conversations about values in your own organization and then finding ways to account for the values um, in your decision making, um, your strategic plan, your, your metrics. Um, so, and I think that's the way the change is going to come in our society is, is from this grassroots bottom-up approach um, because the power brokers, I don't think are interested. There's a lot of lip service, you know, um, fr from this, these um, like World Economic Forum and others, but if they're not going to change the, the underlying power dynamics, I'm not sure how we're ever going to get there, but if we can, you know, uh, create this new mental model of what it means to organize and be in relationship to each other in the context of, of commerce and um, larger, you know, social uh, benefits. I think that's the way that we can get to a new reality. All right. And any final thoughts for um, new teachers and people who want to transform their classroom to include values, anything for them? Um, there, there again, I would go, you know, show how values are fundamental to, in anything you're teaching um, and also to enact and model the values. Um, I found it's mu much less important what I'm teaching than how I'm relating to the students and helping them to develop their own reflective capacity. Um, I was a philosophy major, so helping them get in touch with their values and then how they're expressing those values in the world to find their agency, I think, is the, the main service uh, teachers can do. Great. Well, I want to thank you for taking the time with us this morning, Elizabeth, um, to help us learn how you teach values in the classroom. And um, thank you, everyone. Again, we're, this is going to go on YouTube, and um, we'll make sure everybody gets a link.